welcome to uh, the uh, this weekly episode of uh, Robert and Yaron riffing on the state of the world. Uh, hey, Robert, how's it going? Hey, Yaron, I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. So we're gonna. Uh, we thought we talked today a little bit about kind of the macro macroeconomics, um, the state of the U.S. economy over the last few decades. I think it's it's interesting given that. Uh, given where we are today with uh, rise of inflation, uh, a Fed motivated to um, uh, crush inflation, they claim, we'll see. Uh, it, it, it's a little reminiscent of the 1970s, which is a long time ago. And it is a little surprising that from the 1980s until today, we re- this is the first time we've seen inflation. Inflation was kind of a Given, given fiat money, given um, the fact that the dollar went off any kind of uh, gold standard, any kind of peg that ever existed, it is a little surprising that after the, the inflation of the 1970s and the fear of inflation and everything that happened then, that we just haven't seen it since, we haven't seen it since. It just, it, it, there've been a lot of scares. There've been a number of times where people thought maybe inflation uh, Price inflation, consumer inflation was rising, but it really hasn't happened. Uh, what do you think are some of the reasons why we've gone through such a long period of time where inflation just wasn't present? I think a big part of it is the fear that when inflation is a recent traumatic concern and you don't have a good sense of why inflation went up and so you don't know how you would deal with it in the future. There's a strong tendency to try and avoid getting back in that situation. Well, and, and dealing with it in the early eighties was very painful. So that, that pain of actually dealing with it was remembered. It's like, there's only one way to deal with it, which is to crush demand. And, and I'm not claiming that as a fact. I'm saying that that's the one way it's okay. been yeah. shown. And so if there are other ways, we don't know them, so that it'd be much better to avoid that situation. Uh, It it was politically costly. It was reputationally costly. Nobody benefited from that. And when I mean that, I mean uh, policymakers. I'm sure there are people who benefit from it. So when you are in the 80s and you're getting disinflation, you just want to keep that going. You get in the 90s, Inflation is seemingly very low and mortgage interest rates are at 7% and everyone thinks this is amazing, but you're still interested in keeping that trend. And then you get into the 21st century and you have a a combination of what became possible, uh, which was a massive shift in how manufacturing of physical goods happen and international trade and a shift towards electronic products where you don't have to stamp the albums and distribute them. You can start just selling songs on iTunes or eventually streaming. And so when you have a, an economy that is more and more focused on the consumer side, on uh, virtual goods, and and that's true whether we're talking about physical goods or legitimately virtual goods. But if you're talking about physical goods, we all carry an iPhone that's replaced five different consumer electronics products that were all expensive uh, in the past. And so you're cramming everything into a smaller and smaller physical footprint and some of it not at all. So you end up with a opportunity to increase the supply of what people want at very, very low cost. Uh, It's the difference between having everyone needing to own a car and having rideshare. With the rideshare, you can have a lot fewer cars. But rideshare, you can't both, you 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 and I can't use the car to go different places at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Netflix, we can use Netflix to watch different movies at the same time. And it's at at virtually no incremental cost. So everything was working. Uh, First of all, the attitude of policymakers and the the priorities there. The second, uh, you had an increase in the uh, efficiency of manufacturing of, of new products and Then you had ingenuism, you had a rapid spread of new ideas where the best practices and the the best business models could uh, show up everywhere virtually at the same time. 
and people moving towards virtual goods that could be given away for free like Google, but be incredibly valuable and incredibly lucrative for Google to give away for free. So that's a, a unique situation in history. And it seemed to make you know, low inflation almost inevitable. And then during the financial crisis, everyone was worried about disinflation and the zero bound and all of the, the potential problems that not having inflation would bring. And it was a fundamental shift in, in attitude. People weren't fearing inflation anymore. So when COVID hit, it was like, hey, we can do whatever the hell we want. <laughs> and it can't possibly cause any problems. And of course, the laws of economics hadn't been repealed. They had just shifted and so you had now a shift towards different demand because people were stuck at home uh, and you had a, a constraint on supply so international trade is no longer growing uh, you have uh, just shutdowns in general and so you end up with a lot of a less provided of the products that people are now wanting. And the obvious example is housing, where people suddenly needed more housing because they were home all the time. And the supply of housing reacts very slowly to demand. And so demand goes up, supply is, is similar, and boom, prices shoot up. But that was happening in all sorts of little niches of the economy. And no one thought like, oh, house prices are going up. Isn't that great? Well, you know, if you own a house, maybe. Uh, but nobody thought about the fact that, um, and I shouldn't say nobody, no, no policymakers uh, embodied the fact that the regime had shifted, that the tides that had kept inflation low, regardless of whatever Washington did, had now flipped and what Washington did might actually be really important. Well, and what Washington did was, was, you know, monetary, dramatic monetary expansion and, and a dramatic increase in the money supply. Uh, it seemed like they did that in 08, 09, but if you actually look at the M2 numbers, you know, the monetary, uh, the, the, the quantity of money out there in the economy didn't grow that much. It was mostly held in reserves and, and, uh, but during COVID, uh, you know, so there's a whole phase of helicopter money. They literally did the equivalent of helicopter money, which is basically giving people money, which then turns immediately into people spending that money. And when you're restricting supply by keeping people at home, when supply chains are broken, when the Chinese are doing lockdowns and all kinds of stuff like that, uh, you you get what we're experiencing right now, which is uh, rising uh, raising prices. And it wasn't immediate, of course, because when you're stuck at home, you can't really spend a lot of money on things other than those virtual goods, which can be provided at very low cost. So we all end up uh, with with the Zoom, but and you know, people were buying more streaming, uh, more streaming options. But it it was it's very easy to provide that at relatively low cost and an infinite amount. Uh, there there weren't going to be any constraints on that. But it was predictable that when we finally got over COVID, uh, figuratively, not literally, that we would have to get a match between supply and demand for all the other things yep. that can't be provided or can't be provided as easily. Because I hate to say they can't be provided because that's a chorus where we were completely missing the boat, which is how do you make it so that, uh, how do you remove barriers to entrepreneurs providing the things that people are dying to pay for. And we see, we know they're dying to pay for it because you see prices going up. And if you had a, an easy channel to increase supply, then you wouldn't have inflation. Uh, but that's not the conversation that, that I'm hearing out of Washington. And it's a much better conversation because it involves people getting what they want and other people getting rich providing it as opposed to people not getting what they want and the economy having to go into recession so that they stop wanting it. And, and looking back at the last time inflation was crushed in the 1980s, part of the crushing of inflation was exactly that. That is, if we think about the early 1980s, this is a period of deregulation uh, late 70s, early 80s, saw a lot of the government getting out of the way and allowing supply to be created. It is a period of a lot of innovation on Wall Street to uh, provide growing investment uh, 
for the kind of uh, for the kind of uh, production that is necessary to kind of reduce prices. You know, the first fiber optics cables are laid down across the country because of high yield bonds and all, all kinds of things like that are going on. Uh, American businesses are becoming more efficient because of hostile takeovers and things like that. So it was indeed a period. The, the inflation, you know, Volcker gets all the credit for crushing inflation and he deserves some or some or a lot of it. But there was a lot going on in addition to that. And, and of course, China coming online, that is, that is supply chains changing, production costs going down, globalization, and ingenuism not just being limited to what was going in the US and deregulation, and that's all good, but then applying to a much, they're now a global space, particularly starting in the 90s with the, with the internet um, and with, uh, you know, with, as we like to say, 8 billion people suddenly coming online and suddenly being able to contribute ideas to, uh, to solving all these kind of problems. And yet that is the one piece that seems to be completely absent of the discussion today. They want to do, they kind of talk about doing what Volcker does, but they're not even serious about that really. Uh, but there's almost nobody talking about deregulation on a, on, a, on a large scale, anyway, close to scale we saw in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, what, what, if we're doing analogies, and of course, neither of us believe the, the future will be exactly like the past. It's a useful analogy. Uh, we are not in the late 70s, early 80s. We are in the early mid 70s when inflation, you know, inflation showed up in the 60s. And it was in the, the 70s that you had the, the oil shock, and then suddenly inflation was significant, and nobody knew what to do with it. And then you have a, um, when everyone's spending all their money on, on gas, they're spending less elsewhere. So there's a shift in terms of consumption patterns, which then hampers economic growth because you're set up to provide one set of, of goods and now people are looking for a different set of goods. And it, it's a very confusing time and all policymakers could do is hope it gets better. Because they didn't know what to do. And I'm not claiming that I would have known what to do. I don't even uh, think it, that anyone knows exactly what to do now. But they weren't looking to try and discover that. It was more of a, okay, well, the oil, this oil thing happened, but that's it's already happened. Maybe if we just wait this out, everything will be okay. And that's where we've been for the last 12 months is let's, let's hope this is, is transitory because then we won't have to actually figure out what to do because we don't know what to do and we don't know how to know what to do. Well, as you know, I, I think there were people who knew what to do in the 70s and I think we know what to do today. But... Um, well, but that's a, that's 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 an important point, yeah, and there, there are definitely there are definitely things we should have been doing a year ago and should be doing today. Sure. Um, but once, even when those things start happening, deregulation in the later seventies, and then the monetary uh, regime shift in the early eighties, it took years. Oh, absolutely. Uh, particularly on the production side, I mean, you can change monetary policy pretty quickly. Financial. Mm -hmm movements happen much faster than most of what happens in the real world. So it and would happen faster today, given how much is electronic, given how much is digital. Um, possibly, possibly, we don't know yet, but the point is we need to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, oil, the oil is a great example of that. You know, oil went through this amazing innovation, right? It, this amazing face of, of uh, uh, you know, somebody applying ingenuity to the problem of there's not a lot of oil in the ground anymore in the United States and fracking was invented and it's it, it, brilliant. And uh, instead of spurring that on, uh, when, when other markets are shutting down with regard to oil uh, and as prices are booming, we've got a variety of the pressure, whether it's uh, from institutional investors based on ESG or whether it's from the government itself, uh, disencouraging or, 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 or making it more difficult for frackers to go out and frack. And not just in the US, globally. I know, it's fracking crazy. But, but in, in all seriousness, I don't know that if I were running a fracking company, and I know that people are running fracking companies, I don't know that I would, I would want to make big investments right now because the writing on the wall is pretty clear about the long term. And these are long term investments. And if you, so you have the choice, you can either make money at $115 a barrel, which is, you know, two or three times your, your decent return point. I was going to say break even, but it's certainly more than two times break even. So maybe it's twice uh, a great return on investment and three times break even, but you're just printing money. And what you would normally do is, is grow your business 
but your alternative is to just print money. Yep. And the way that this has been framed is I don't think uh, I don't think fossil fuels is the answer to the energy issue um, because and I don't mean that like I philosophically believe that or I don't think it could be. But I think it, given the world that we're in and given the fact that that uh, global warming is is being being made a priority over other forms of human well-being mm -hmm. that the solution needs to be discovered elsewhere. And, you know, you know, I'm a big advocate for uh, exploring the, the potential of nuclear power. I think fusion, unfortunately, is going to be a distraction. It's going to be like solar where we're five years away from something interesting for 30 years. Okay. And then eventually it shows up. But for the next 30 years, it's not going to be a, it's unfortunately unlikely to be a big contributor, but modular modern fission reactors, uh, getting on the learning curve with that, that could be making a difference five years from now. It's still five years from now. It's not, nothing is going <laughs> to, nothing is going to bail us out in the next five months. It's going to, this the world's going to be the way it is, but we could be doing things now. We could have been doing things five years ago that would help us discover what are the real opportunities, but we've not, we've been in a, a static, uh, and I'll say fantasy world uh, around renewables where we're not looking at the full portfolio of renewables. We're not looking at the stable portfolio of renewables. Uh, hydro is pretty much tapped out, but geothermal and uh, nuclear might have the same kind of impact that fracking did. Uh, because if you look at oil price graphs, which I think people are looking at a lot more than they have for decades, is you know we're back to prices that we saw 10 years ago and prices that we saw or eight years ago and the prices that we saw in the early 80s uh, but overall if you compare the price of oil or gas or any of this to say the cost of a college education it looks very reasonable Absolutely. Uh, because a lot has been figured out on how to make it more efficient you know one other aspect of um that I think is making it harder to get out of the current crisis is kind of, in a sense, kind of a backlash against um, globalization, a, you know, a, a sudden hunkering down of building walls and, and looking internally rather than externally. And I think that both affects trade, but it also affects information flows. It also potentially affects, um, you know, uh, the, the whole idea of ingenuism, the, the idea that, that, you know, ideas can be generated anywhere and they can be built on top of one another because people are trying to build uh, uh, walls, not, a, you know, China, Russia, uh, and, and, but even, even here in the United States and, and Europe. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because that's definitely a force in the world today. And the counterbalancing force is that we all got a lot more used to interacting and, and collaborating remotely. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's hard for me to predict whether that's going to be a significant problem. I think that the, that the actual barriers of, of COVID and the fact that the world is, so if you're looking, if you're trying to, to be a global entrepreneur, you're at the whim of at least a half dozen important governments mm -hmm. around the world. And that's just a, a different level of risk than when you are just dealing with, you know, your local government or the federal government or the Chinese government, you know, one. Uh, and it doesn't really, it's not really diversification. In a sense, there's some diversification because when China was shut down, everyone else was, was shutting down, everyone else was opening back up. But when there are bottlenecks everywhere, uh, it, it, it's the wrong kind of diversification because you end up with all these critical points. And if one of them is always out, then you never run efficiently. Yes. And we're definitely moving, at least it seems like ideologically, the world is moving away from the kind of interconnected idea that, you know, hopefully there are counter forces against that. And hopefully that'll, it, it, it'll come back, but it certainly seems to be right now unpopular to think in terms of an interconnected world and a, and, and a, you know, a, a, the kind of the kind of world that led, I think, to the great moderation in, during the early two thousands, where 
uh, supply chains were super efficient and uh, there was a huge movement of people, of goods, of capital, and, and everything flowed pretty smoothly at very, very low costs and, uh, and very, very low. I mean, what you're bringing up about different countries is this idea of political risk, which I think for a long time, everybody assumed was basically zero or very low. And uh, suddenly, partially because of the war in Ukraine and partially just because of the attitude towards China, political risk is now much, much higher. And that kind of slows collaboration down. And you couldn't have predicted any of that. If, you, if we went back to the late 70s, early 80s, and you said, look, inflation is actually not going to be a problem for the next 40 years. It's going to continuously fall. It's going to uh, you know, approach you know, levels at which people start worrying about it being too low. Uh, how do you think that happened? It wouldn't be obvious in advance because people had to figure this stuff out. And they, were, they had the opportunity with the lower, low, you know, the low cost and falling cost of uh, transporting things by sea, and the increased connectivity that allowed collaboration across the planet, and so that's a, that's where I think we are today. Uh, that we don't know what's going to um, come out of this, you know, massive shock to what how the world was running and, and running really well. Uh, and if we can get give people the freedom to discover that sooner rather than later, it'll make a huge impact on the well-being of people on the planet. And not so much you know, people in America who are generally going to be just fine, but for the people who are just starting to catch the wave, people in, in Asia, people in Africa, people in South America, uh, that if we don't if we, and I mean this not as a collective we, I mean as each of us individually um, aren't figuring out how to make the new world work, then it's, it's going to be an enormous human tragedy. Yeah, and, and there's another tragedy here in the sense that, I mean, you say here in America will be fine, and, and, and that's probably true. But we've run the numbers, like if, if the U.S. economy grows at 1%, 2% a year versus if the U.S. economy grows at 4 5% a year, the missed opportunity of that lack of growth is a massive human tragedy. It's, you know, in every respect, in terms of the quality and, and kind of life that we could have and that the poor among us could have, even though the poor in America are not as poor or, or nowhere near as poor as the poor elsewhere, they're still poor. You know, the missed opportunity, the opportunity cost of not getting it right is, is, is just massive. And that's a really good point. And that, that, you know, we'll be fine, but our kids, our grandkids, they won't be relative to where things are. And that's, of course, always the challenge is uh, the people, people and countries get to a certain stage of, of life where they're more interested in companies. And they're more interested in holding on to what they have than uh, exploring what could possibly be. Well, and that's, and that's the sense in which, you know, ingenuism, you know, what we really, what the answer to these questions is almost always is, is, you know, free people up to figure out solutions to these things. And the more people you free up uh, under conditions where they really have the ability uh, without asking for permission to solve problems and go out there and, and get stuff done, uh, the, the faster we get out of the problems that, we, that, that have been created. Uh, and, and, and that's true globally. That's true in America and that's true everywhere in the world. Yeah, we, and we solve problems that we didn't even know we had, which is a really yep. interesting question. So maybe it's not just us, because the, the problems for us is, is that is human mortality. But, you know, that's that's a problem that is slowly being solved and you know, could end up being um, relevant to us, even though I always think it's relevant to our kids and our grandkids. Um, there's always something and and not having not having an ingenuous attitude towards you know, what great things are possible now that given everything we know that we didn't know 10 years ago and everything we have that we didn't have 10 years ago, what are the great things we can do today, as opposed to look at the great stuff we have now. It's a, it's a, it's an, I, I want to distinguish it from the treadmill, like the, the rat race, because it's not that, 
It's yep. like uh, you climb to the top of the mountain and there's another mountain, except you're not really climbing. You're riding with a jetpack in a, a spaceship or something. It's because that's our, our natural as humans, we're naturally uh, cautious when we're in a good situation. And that that's the time when you can afford to be the most ambitious. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, on that positive note, um, thanks, Robert. I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Take care. Bye.